in Europe, we are seeing that new leaders that are coming to power in Netherlands, in Slovakia, we had Orban. They are against this war in Ukraine, against sending more aids, more weapons to Ukraine. How influential would that be? on the U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine. It's having an effect, obviously. Uh, um, Orban by himself uh, blocked the formal approval of the next round of uh, European assistance. Uh, FICO in uh, Slovakia will be joining that cause. The government in uh, the Netherlands is still being negotiated. But the party that came out number one, as you said, Wilders, uh, is against further aid. Uh, of course, the new Polish government is probably is pretty gung-ho for uh, more uh, financial and military support to Ukraine. Things are dragging out, uh, but most of Europe uh, does their best to follow blindly the United States. This is really tragic, uh, though all of these uh, cracks uh, in the foundation are, are clearly appearing. What's stunning is if you look up approval rating of world leaders at one of the websites that uh, reports weekly opinion polling, there's not a European leader that has a net positive approval rating. Most of them are incredibly unpopular. Uh, Schultz, uh, 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 Janos uh, Garstori in, uh, in Norway, uh, uh, Macron, hugely unpopular. Uh, they're promoting war is not winning public support. There's no one in Europe that has a net positive approval rating in this group of NATO boosters, not even close. And the ratings keep going down and down. Look what's happening to Schultz in Germany. It's a collapse of public support. And in the United States, Biden does not have public support for his foreign policy. We know that Austria are trying to block the new package of sanctions on Russia. Is that possible that Austria can make some middle ground for both sides? I think that uh, more and more politicians in Europe are understanding this is wrong. It was a terrible mistake. It's not working. Uh, they generally are so beholden to the United States or for one reason or another afraid of it or bought off that they don't say in public what they often say in private. But there are more European politicians uh, coming to the fore, definitely saying we've got to stop this uh, and um, that will have uh, an effect not from one day to the next, but it's definitely coming. Similarly, in the United States, uh, public opinion is, is, is gone for this. Uh, Congress, which uh, listens to the military industrial complex, uh, is in angst because they want to vote more money for weapons. Uh, the Democrats want to support Biden, but it's completely wrongheaded to be sending tens of billions of dollars more without even an attempt at negotiations. So I think that this is a, a failing policy that will come to an end. It has to, and it doesn't have to, but it's very likely to in 2024, but it's agonizingly slow. And what is so frustrating is the absence of uh, many voices of sanity. Viktor Orban in Hungary is one of them. FICO is a voice of sanity. There are very few right now. As you mentioned, the U.S. foreign policy is so important. What's happening to the Democratic Party? We know that Cornel West, Jill Stein, even Bobby Kennedy, they're not welcome in the Democratic Party. They have to find their, <laughs> their way of fighting in the new election. What the Democratic Party is losing for the next election? How do you see their situation? Well, I'll give you a personal answer. They lost my vote. I used to be a Democrat. I used to vote uh, Democratic uh, basically uh, all my life. And uh, I have left the party. Uh, and I put it in personal terms because I think I reflect a view that is uh, quite widespread. The Democratic Party for me is unrecognizable right now. 
Uh, when I joined the Democrats, I joined uh, originally in, in the 1960s, uh, as I was still in high school, so I was a, a, a kid. But the idea was, it was at least the part of our political system that was against the Vietnam War. And there was always a, a strong uh, leftist part of the Democratic Party that was anti-war. And that was what I felt was my home. Now there isn't any anti-war part of the Democratic Party at all. Uh, not in the Congressional Democratic Party, not in the White House. You don't find other than a very, very few people uh, any voice for this right now. All the mainstream voices are more war, more funding. Uh, the uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer was at school same time I was at, at Harvard. Uh, I've known him for many, many decades. Uh, what's his role right now? Well, keep the Senate uh, uh, in session so that we can uh, still send more money to Ukraine. It's terrible. There's no thinking anymore. It's incredibly ignorant. Uh, and this is across the Democratic Party. So it's uh, it's it's really quite uh, quite upsetting. Is the political arena of the United States ready to have a third party, even fourth party? We have Bobby Kennedy, who was not welcome in the Democratic Party. I don't know what they're thinking of, but he has a very good chance of getting more votes from the Democratic Party. We have Cornel West and Jill Stein. Those are so important candidates to make some equilibrium within the Democratic Party. I think the mainstream Democrats uh, are... Uh, are, are extremely confused and befuddled and the wrong message uh, and they've lost their way and Biden is uh, is a terrible candidate and has been basically a warmonger during this whole period so it's uh, it it is a position that is outside of American public opinion right now uh, They've opened the door more for Trump than just about any anything else. I sensed it from the beginning that strangely, because it's a principle of American politics that foreign policy is not decisive. I said, you're going to go down on the foreign policy, which is really something. Uh, it was so bad, so misconceived. I wrote a, a few articles about that that uh, this makes no sense, even politically, much less geopolitically, if I could put it that way. It makes no sense in terms of domestic politics. And this is how things are playing out right now. The American public rejects uh, Biden's foreign policy. Uh, he is not going to win re-election, most likely, and not certainly not on this approach. And I want you to specifically comment on Cornel West and Jill Stein. Because oh, you know, they're they're fine people. They're not going to be president, most likely. They're fine people. Bobby Kennedy has a much larger following and a much larger position in, in the polls. And we'll see what the dynamics are now. Uh, so uh, th there are, I mean, Cornel West is a wonderful person. I've been friendly uh, with him for decades. Uh, I don't know Jill Stein personally. But um, it's it's Bobby Kennedy that has the the name, the the uh, uh, public recognition, uh, the position in the opinion polls, and he certainly has a, an open chance. I, I I urge him all the time: be the candidate of peace. <laughs> You'll win if you're the candidate of peace. This is uh, really important. This is what the American people want. Is it possible for him to convince Cornel West or even Jill Stein to, to, to be part of his campaign? Well, I think right now, uh, you know, they're each going to do their thing. They're each going to run. Uh, we're, we're still uh, almost a year away from the election. So a lot can happen between now and next November. And, and we'll see. But for the moment, they're going to campaign uh, and uh Right now, Bobby Kennedy shows up in the opinion surveys typically uh, between 10 and 20 percent uh, of support. That's a lot for a third party candidate. And we're early, early days because uh, 
most Americans are not really focused on the elections. This is still very much a, a professional politician thing at this point, and it will only start to heat up uh, at the beginning of next year with primaries and caucuses, and then we'll see how things evolve. Just before wrapping up this session, I want to know your opinion on this U.S. economic war on China. How is it going with these two conflicts in Ukraine and in Israel? We know that China is doing, they're doing their way, they're, they're growing. And how do you see right now in the U.S.? Are they focused on the economy? Are they focused on these wars? How these wars going to benefit the economy? It is uh, pretty much uh, taken for granted among the mainstream of both the Democratic and the Republican parties, I have to say, that China's an enemy. Uh, and uh, the rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis China is extremely stupid low-level, ignorant, uh, and dangerous. Uh, and this is both parties, uh, because even uh, uh, parts of the Republican Party that are not interested in the Ukraine war want to stop the funding to a significant extent, say, yes, because we need the resources to fight China. And so there's a kind of comic book feeling to it that, oh, there could be a war with China. That would just be fine and dandy. Uh, of course, it could end the world. It's so reckless and dangerous the way that our politicians talk, the way the mainstream media uh, report things, uh, say, yeah, coming war with China as if that's, uh, you know, a, a normal kind of statement uh, as opposed to something absolutely horrifying. Uh, and the rhetoric about uh, Taiwan as if Taiwan is uh, the 51st American state, uh, as if the United States doesn't have a, a one China diplomatic policy, which they seem to forget. Uh, it's all quite dangerous. Uh, the U.S. starting with Trump, actually starting with Obama in political ways, starting with Trump in trade policies and now with Biden in trade policies, finance policies, technology policies, is really leaning hard against China. Uh, it's doing some damage uh, to Chinese uh, uh, macroeconomics in the short term because it's really uh, stopped the growth of China's exports to the U.S. market, and Europe has broadly gone along with this. Uh, and so that is hurting a bit, but I think China has ways around that, including expanding its role in the non-US, non-EU world. And I expect that that to happen. China's underlying strengths for growth are very strong. It's a, a high saving uh, society with excellent education uh, and a very strong research development uh, and uh, enterprises uh, that are at the cutting edge of many technologies, whether it's electric vehicles or renewable energy or uh, advanced computation, China has great, great depth and strength. So this is not a fly-by-night uh, economy. This is a very, very serious and sophisticated economy with a lot of geopolitical support. Uh, and uh, I don't think the United States can quote, contain China. It's a terrible idea, uh, an absurd idea, a dangerous idea, and I don't think uh, possibly a successful idea.